you have to allow the weirdness of these times to let it change your art form. I want to say a big thank you uh, to Sue Henderson for coming on TBD today. Um, I read your book a year ago, uh, Flicker of Old Dreams, and uh, Ms. Greenbaum had a terrific book club. It's a high power. It's a high octane book club, and they they're they're very uh, very well read uh, group. And uh, I thought it was just fascinating your process, your creativity, and uh, really the beauty of your writing. So I want to thank you for being here with, uh, with members of my English class and colleagues of mine. So thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, one of the biggest questions I've had about your work is setting. It's mm -hmm. about setting. And uh, before I begin talk or asking you a little bit about your relationship to setting, um, I want to show, I want to get the right uh, Facebook screen of some of your photos. Yes. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about your feeling about setting. Oh my gosh, look at how you can screen share. You're good at this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, for this book and my current book, I found my story via the setting. And um, just since we're talking to an English class, I I feel like the, the most important thing to remember about writing before I talk about setting is um, if you think of a story as writing, then you only have one tool, which is words. But if you think of story more broadly as storytelling and creating story, then you have like all of these other um, tools in your toolkit. So what I do when I'm starting, and I don't quite know what I'm writing about, but I know I'm obsessed about something, I start with my setting and I actually just wander around my setting not knowing what I want to write about. And so in this particular setting, um, the thing that I wanted to write about that I felt just sort of loosely was that um, the country felt so divisive and full of rage, this idea of two Americas. Um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to say about it except for that I didn't want to write about politics. So I started thinking, well, where might this story be? What is a place that I'm just kind of obsessed about? And so I thought about this town where my dad grew up. It's a town of 180 people in um, Winnet, Montana. Um, in the book, it's called Petroleum. And I went there for a month and I just started just kind of wandering around. I moved into um, the spooky little um, Hunter's Lodge that they had there. Um, I was the only person in this town that um, didn't live in the town. And when I say it's a town of 180 people, what I really mean is across a very wide um, array of land, there's 180 people, but in town, there's maybe like seven people. <laughs> so oh. I stuck out a lot and I just wandered around. I felt it. I smelled it. I, um, anytime I ran into people, I talked to them. I asked questions. And after being there, I just started, I started getting attached to um, some of the stories they told or some of the landmarks, the, the old grain elevator that I didn't even know what a grain elevator was when I first went to this town. Mm -hmm. The feel of the wind, how, how you had to basically shout to have people hear you when you were outside because the wind was so loud. Um, but I was there and I took a bunch of pictures and I just kind of experienced it. And then when I got back to New York, I had, um, I had all these pictures and I started showing people the pictures and I, and I was disappointed because I felt like I'd, I'd spent all that time there and still didn't know what I wanted to write about. But once I got back to New York and I had some distance, I looked at these pictures and I thought, oh, I am looking at something in the process of dying. I'm looking at a way of life that's dying away. And all of a sudden, the rage and the two Americas and the divisiveness and this dying town started to kind of form a story. 
And then, um, and then I thought, well, who could tell the story of a dying town and a dying way of life? And I saw it and I brainstormed and stuff. And as soon as I came up with the idea of a mortician, I was just like, ding, that's, that's fun. Um, so the idea of like the death of small town America as told by a mortician, that becomes something that I'm really interested in. And since I'm a slow writer, it takes me five or six years to write a book. Um, I thought those are two, that town and mor um, mortuary stuff, I could stay with that for six years and not get bored of it. So that's kind of. What I love about your process is that, you know, the cliche is that write about what you know, mm -hmm. but I think what you've done is write about what you want to know. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's not very interesting for me to know, like, I don't need to share my opinions with people. What I want to learn is what do I not know? What do I not know about myself? What do I not know about the world? What do I think I know that I have a misunderstanding about? And um, I liked the fact that I walked around in that town. You know, I had all my New York opinions um, that I brought with me. And a lot of them were really kind of broken down and um, dismissed while I was there. It just kind of, um, it makes you think bigger um, when, when you dial down your own opinions and just kind of stop and listen for a while. My father wanted me, part of his notes, I'm, I'm <laughs> notes from my father. Uh, he said he wanted you to know that he grew up uh, in tenements in Brooklyn. His whole family lived on one mm. small section of the street. And he said, but he related to the book because of the, the small town gossip, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the history, uh, the whispers yeah. um, about the father and affairs and all the backstory that he felt that you had captured that. And he related to it, even though uh, he did not grow up in Montana. <laughs> That's pretty cool that, that someone from Brooklyn can can sort of connect to characters that live so far away. That's really neat. I appreciate that. And that's one of the things we we talk about in um, my course. We we start the year talking about how literature is both a window into someone else's experience, but a mirror reflecting oftentimes our own, even if the if the details of the narrative are different yeah. than our own experience. The emotions may be yeah. one that we can uh, reflect on. Uh, in terms of your characterization then, are you pulling from uh, your own experiences or a variety of other people that you've kind of assembled into the story? I think you can't help but pull some from yourself, which is why if anyone from your class went to that same town and tried to write that same story, it would be their own because everybody has their own lived experience, their own lens, their own temperament, which is why writing is so powerful because each of us can only tell uh, our own unique story and our own unique lens of the world, even if we're, you are um, all writing about the exact same topic. And so um, I think like most writers, I'm kind of like a pack rat of um, sensory information. And so um, I might write in an elevator and hear something interesting. And, and I feel like um, writing, it's like, it's like you've got this great big stew pot and you just put like all these different ingredients into it that you can dip into all the time. So it might be the things that you fear, the things that you dream about, um, the things that you're obsessed with. Um, I happen to be obsessed with plagues, you know, so if anyone ever talks about smallpox or something, I'm like, I'm always collecting that information. Um, anything that you um, love tactilely, like, a, like if you make quilts, if you um, are really into smells, if you're into collage, these are all things that just kind of go into this pot. And then and then through that, you you are filtering everything through your personality, your mood of the day. One of my favorite writing techniques is to use the mood that you're in. So um, if let's say if I'm going to work one day, um, my, my work is um, 
I, I work in my garage, um, which is where you are with me today. But um, when I go to work, let's say if I accidentally went on Twitter before I started working and I, and I read this giant rant thread and it got me in a bad mood, rather than trying to kind of settle my mood down before I start the day, it's like, oh, what could I do with this rage that I feel? <laughs> and so then a lot of times I can either work on my scene where my characters have to fight because my rage can help access that scene or a more interesting thing to do is maybe take my love scene that I'm working on and bring this kind of dissonant mood to that as I edit that scene. And then you're gonna get like an interesting texture to that um, scene. It's not gonna be flat. It's now complicated with with my bad mood. It's like writer response theory. You know, we, we've talked about how the reader brings something to the table and it's kind of a given that the writer does, but it, it answers a question I have about writing either sequentially or so you're writing in what what's moving you at the moment mm -hmm. and then you can assemble it and i see a quilt behind you so yes. you can come back and assemble those elements in, in, afterward you know so you're yes. in the, yes and that also i'm sure helps you with you know this idea people get hung up on writer's block that mm -hmm. seems to be but if you're just going you're you're channeling your own personal experience yeah. you're not going to get stuck like no i have to i have to fit my mindset into what i'm writing you're, you're well I, so so if you're a um if you're a novel writer you're sort of an expert on um tackling writer's block uh because a novelist to, to sustain your interest in something for five six years if if you write as slowly as i do and to go to work every day and create something, you have to sort of redefine create for one thing. And so my feeling is you tell the story any way you can. So I have a friend who um, does collages for each of her characters. Um, so she does everything from fabric. She knows what they, they have in their pockets. She knows their nightmares. She knows who they have a crush on. And she just kind of builds like a a collage storyboard, like physically cuts out pictures and stuff and, and storyboards them. Um, and then later when she's working on a scene, she can take that collage out. Um, I just, the other day I was working on, um, in the current book I'm in, I have them in this kind of um, uh, abandoned, um, dangerous building and I started writing and it just got, it was just really, it, the writing was boring and also I was bored. So I just decided to draw a map of um, the place. And so again, it's like, if you think of writing as words and you don't have words, then you're stuck. But if you think of writing as you're building a story, then you can paint, you can sing, you can, um, I very often, I go hiking with my dog who's pretty much using up the whole chair right now. Um, I go hiking and I talk my story out, um, which is also fantastic. Um, if, if you have dyslexia or something, you can always tell a story easier than you can write it and then you just transcribe it later. Um, so there's so many ways to kind of enter the magic of a story world and I love let's say I want to read one line mm -hmm. that to me just has such a it says so much in its imagery. This is about the relationship uh, between the father and the daughter in uh, the flicker of all dreams. He popped me on the head to remind me not to litter, but in a nice way that made me show him my chocolate covered teeth. Mm -hmm. And I thought it's such a it's in that one sentence you have a whole relationship mm -hmm. uh and you also this detail of her smiling with the chocolate covered teeth i thought was that's the kind of nuance that shows you're observing the world around you mm -hmm. you know you see these oh that's a detail or you know i i can in, in, envision that moment yeah that yep. you've provided um 
but now it's so so you have this you have this one book set in this dying small town mm -hmm. and now i want to take us to the other setting Okay. I almost feel like we should have a drum roll. <laughs> King's Park now, you're not you're you're not originally from Kings Park. Did you know of the Kings Park Psychiatric Hospital? Let me make sure I'm sharing the right we one. We bought a house at Kings Park before we knew of it. <laughs> it was just like this awesome surprise that was down the street from us. So you do you walk uh, this this abandoned property? Yeah, so it's it's walking distance from my house, and um, I've just, it's just, um, so my kids are now, they're, um, one, one is um, in graduate school and one just graduated from college, but when they were teenagers, they, um, they actually made a, a small apartment <laughs> inside this abandoned hospital, <laughs> um, and they went, um, on trash day, you know, when people throw out their couches and stuff, they picked up like all this furniture and they brought it over to Psych, we call it Psych, and um, made this little um, apartment up there and swept all the raccoon poo into a, like a pile in the corner so that it wasn't in the way. And um, so it's just been just a part of kind of the lore of living in Kings Park. So um, at some point I was just like, I am obsessed with this place, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna write something at this place. So I did the same thing, not knowing what I wanted to write about and knowing that the history of something that's been there 150 years, that's, that's too large a time span for the kind of writing I do. Um, I'm not like a historical writer. So I just started walking around this place just with an open mind about what the story might be and, and paying attention to what I was obsessed about. Okay, as you can see, I've started going in the building at some mm -hmm. point. Um, and so as I was walking around in this place and then I would meet everybody inside, um, I met there's homeless people, there's former staff, there's graffiti artists, there's uh, drug addicts, there's... Um, uh, a night watchman who who had um, uh, social anxiety issues and was afraid to get out of his car. And there were so many interesting people I met. And I and I slowly started getting closer to what the uh, you see my kids in there too. Um, slowly getting closer to what the story would be. So I, I started um, meeting a lot of people who used to work there or be patients there and I would just talk to them. And as I was talking to them, um, a few people just very casually gave me this information that I was just like, what? And the information was that um, there were babies that were born to patients there so I started asking the people that worked there or that um, were patients there, could you could you tell me more about this? Did you ever hear about this? So um, of the babies that were born at Psych, if they weren't adopted out, they just raised them there along with the patients. And so that's that's when I was like, okay, now I've got <laughs> now I know where I'm going with my story, but what I still didn't know is where did I want to um, take a, like a slice of the history there. And I realized that um, what I was most interested in as I talked to people was the closing of the hospital because I loved the the idea of deinstitutionalization, and then there was the reality of what it was. It was different than what people hoped it would be when they when they closed all these hospitals. Um, and I was very interested in the vibrant hospital and, and then this place where my kids had this apartment. Um, and so now I'm just kind of staying in that little time space. Um, and I've got all these photos. Occasionally I go back in, but I, I broke my hand in March and that made it really, it made it harder to get in and out of the um, the windows there. Um, My goodness. Yeah. Uh, but and, the, but when the pandemic hit, all of us who break into this place we were like, great, we've already got so many masks. You know. <laughs> you were all set. Yeah. What year? Did, what year did the hospital close again? 
1996, so pretty okay. recently. Yeah. And what I find interesting about that is it's both the end of something, but mm -hmm. you're talking about these babies who were born there, that yeah. their lives began there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then trying, I tried to track them down because even though I'm writing fiction, I like to I like to collect as much um, real information as I can to kind of pull from it. And I just love like the the moss that grows on the inside of the building and all the poison ivy that's growing up the walls on the inside and stuff. I just I love this place. And it's like nature comes back. Nature yeah. is taking it over. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and so I, I get, do you feel the space is haunted? I don't, but I, I talked to some people that did and I took their stories because I really wanted to grab what every writer wants is to stand in the moral gray area of the story. So if there's anything that where um, people have conflicting points of view, um, you have the um, the people that were very proud of the work that they did there. And then you have the people that are really mostly interested in ghosts and lobotomies. And, and those the, the friction between those two groups is very interesting to me. Um, the, the people that say that they're sensitive and that they've had ghost experience, I definitely talked to a lot of them and I, um, I will be using some of that in... Um, uh, the story, but uh, you're always looking for characters that clash and you want to try to put them in scenes together. So, so it's, so it's, you're trying to give a voice to all the different mm -hmm. constituencies, I guess you could say. Yeah, you know, yeah. The, the, the ghost hunters and the historians, and then the people who were professionals there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a and it's a huge uh, place at its height. Do you know how many people yeah. were institutionalized there? Ten thousand at the height. <laughs> well, that's yeah. certainly bigger than patrol <laughs> in Montana. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and 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 this whole town was founded on that. So when the hospital closed, it really changed the nature of this town and the jobs in this town. So it's it's pretty interesting ground. You took quite a number of photos. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of a research nut. Um, I just find um, if you walk around in the setting that you want to write in, you just um, you'll find things there that you didn't know were there. And I think what what became most interesting to me as I was walking around is everyone has opinions about the work that people did, whether they were good people or not, whether the patients were good people, were they really crazy? There were so many people had opinions, but I started to feel like the, the onus is now starting to be on us. If, if you have deinstitutionalization, then the caretakers become us, the people in the community. And how are we contributing to people's better lives or how are we not? And so that's something that I'm kind of sitting with right now is if, um, if, if we could, if the hospitals are up, you know, like a one flew over the cuckoo's nest, if you want to go and look in there and, and judge the people that worked there, well, now that they're here in our community, now that they're kind of dispersed, now we are the people that are are in position to be judged about how we're how we're taking care of our of our people. You know? Right. It strikes me as a, a pendulum. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have them either com people who have mental health issues are either completely institutionalized mm -hmm. or totally abandoned into the community with yeah. few resources. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And it's I, I'm, I guess I, I can't help but draw parallels then to the abandonment the people in Montana felt as yeah. time passed them by, you know. Yeah, it's funny. Um I, when I was in college, I remember my professor would say, everyone seems to, it, each author seems to have one book that they keep writing in different forms. And sometimes you can't tell until you're a little bit past them. But I'm starting to think like, oh, I actually, if you line 
my work up and my short stories and, and things like that, you start to see themes and, and there is something that um, I'm not sure I could put my finger on it quite, but I'm always, if there are mothers and daughter relationships or absent mothers and daughters, I'm definitely drawn to that. And, and um, towns that have kind of had the rug pulled out from them, um, that is definitely something that I keep my, I always track that, like I will always turn my head towards that. Oh, you know what? I should show you in just little author cheats. If you look inside any of my books, they, I don't know if you can see this, but um, most authors are really shy. And so the idea of like doing readings is like a terrifying thing. So I have um, colors inside the thing to remind me to look up to the audience and then I can find my page again. And I have my off the cuff things that I'm gonna say, they're actually written down. Um, so there's little cheats. I used to do that as a, as a teacher uh, when I first started, I had everything by minute. Yeah. yeah. Now, now say, say something warm and fuzzy to your students. Um, I did. I did away with that. Right, guys. You also seem to have a penchant for technical, you know, like the technicality of the mortuary science. Mm -hmm. Is your new, uh, is the book you're working on now technical? And it doesn't have a, the same kind of, uh, you know, in the psychiatric world? Yeah, in, in not not in the ways that you think, but yeah, I the the best thing about being an author. So I I went to um, undergrad for biomedical engineering, so I, I have like other interests, and um, and I think the great thing about being an author is that you can you can live like multiple lives. And so there are things that like you can, you can be a mortician for a little while and then quit that job. And then, you know, now I, I'm studying all these other things because I, I love, I love just like ingesting information. I love learning about what I don't know. Um, I mean, they, it's like my favorite thing. What do I not know? <laughs> you know? And then I just like, I just love to just, be in a world that's brand new to me. But I actually had a few questions for you. Okay. Um, when you started, you mentioned that leaving New York and seeing uh, these, visiting these isolated communities, whether it's uh, Kings Park mm -hmm. or it's, it's uh, Petroleum, uh, Montana, uh, the idea that you're seeing these, these isolated communities that are withering away. Mm -hmm. But yet for you, you know, typically the trajectory uh, for someone to come, become worldly is from leaving a small town to go to a big city. Mm -hmm. And for you, it seems you did the opposite. So my question is, how did those experiences change you? Not necessarily as a writer, mm -hmm. uh, but your your views, because I know that's a question that most of us are asking. You know, why yeah. is why is why are the coasts so different from the center of the country? Um, yeah. Um, so. First of all, when I write, the most important thing to me is I don't want to be the same person when I get to the end of writing my book. I want to have been changed. And same when, when I read a book, if it's, if it's a good book, it will actually change me. Um, I think when I went to this little town, I was feeling much more judgmental. I was, and I was feeling um, an anger that I kind of couldn't get over. Um, and I think walking in the town made me feel, um, made me remember I was among human beings that go home and they worry about their kids and they worry about what to cook for dinner. So, so on a very just kind of a straightforward level, it just made me m more empathic. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me when I was in this little town was um, I became very embarrassed about my hands. Um, and it was because I'm walking around, I would shake someone's hand and I would tell them I was a writer and it just sounded so, um, not lazy, but so weird to talk to people whose hands were just like dirty and um, 
they would shake your hand and like the calluses on their hands would like cut you. Um, and to realize how soft my hands were, and I, I didn't ever think of myself as privileged in that way of, of not, not having my hands in the soil and, and the being able to just like think all day. Um, and I think um, one of the main things when you said what's different about the coast uh, versus the middle of the country is it was amazing to me how little diversity there was there and how little exposure they had to things except for TV. And so you realize that um, there were just all kinds of people that they hadn't they hadn't been exposed to. And there was all kinds of hands-on work that I hadn't been exposed to. So it was just, um, and, and I remember several people who were there, they were just like, is it scary living in New York? And I was thinking I'd never been scared <laughs> until I was in this little town and like walking alone on a road was terrifying to me that I was like, alone. I, I, I watched a documentary last year about a, a film director who spoke about the importance of knowing where your movie or your book is going to end. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you agree with that sentiment, uh, you know, using that analogy of the quilt, I've never made yeah. one myself, <laughs> uh, but I have done jigsaw puzzles. And usually I start by trying to outline the border yeah. and then filling in the middle. Uh, would you say that writing follows a similar trajectory or it, it you can't really categorize it that way? So everyone has their own um, process. And in some ways um, it's good to like look at different ones, but then you, you have to, you have to be true to your own nature. Um, I have more and more become attracted to the idea of having some solid bones in the work. Like the, the, the work I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm, being much more thoughtful and I and I kind of know in general where I want to land. Um, I do think I, I've got a couple books that I think are really good. I, I pulled them out. Um, so there's there's a book called The Writer's Journey, which is basically if you know um, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey, um, Joe is actually my my husband's uncle, um, but this guy Chris Chris Vogler um, happened to to kind of condense the the hero's journey into um, a much more readable form because I, I find Joe gets a little um, his his writing is a little thick it's 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 just very dense to get through. Um, best book ever for a writer is John Truby Anatomy of a Story, um, but this is a it is the best book um, you could ever have as a writer, but it's very, very, very hard and it can be intimidating and it's not easy to be in the middle of the process and pick up this book because you'll feel destroyed. Um, it's not a good confidence lifter. And then if you need a confidence booster, um, Save the Cat writes a novel. It's basically, basically all these books kind of help you get bones in your story and help you um, it, I like to think of it as like a map. So, um, you don't want, if you're going on a journey from New York to San Francisco, um, you don't need to know every place, everything that's going to happen to you along the way, because hopefully there's surprises along the way. Um, but you want to know you're going from New York to San Francisco and you want to have some dots on the map on the way um, so that before you start out, you kind of know where you're going to go. And then you might be really surprised when you stop where you meant to stop and you get out and you have an experience that's entirely not what you expected to have or you meet someone or you get a, a flat tire or all those things. But in general, you want to know kind of where you're heading. Um, and you just don't know all the things that you don't know the magic that's going to happen along the way. So kind of think of it that way. <laughs> so I, I do a bit of writing in my free time sort of as a hobby. And I do like to write from experiences, especially emotional experiences. So I was wondering if you had any general advice for aspiring writers. 
my main advice is um, trust that um, you have a unique lens on the world and trust that your voice matters. Um, nobody has walked in your shoes exactly with your personality and yeah, your yeah. experiences. And so the main thing is just trust that um, you have you have a story to tell. As a student, now you studied science, but were you always writing? I was, but I I, I think of it more as um, I was always an observer. And I think that's more important than the fact that I'm not someone who like writes a certain number of words a day. Um, I, I pay attention. Um, I smell things, I touch things. And I've always been like that. You know, I've, I've always been, you know, there would be a a school play in third grade and I would notice what someone's doing under the seat. I would notice if there's gum stuck to the seat. I was just that person that was just kind of if there was someone who was cutting the back of a chair during the play. Um, I think writers are, are those people. They're those observers. And reading wise, so what was a book? Were you an avid reader as a? As oh my a god, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was. I had two things that I was known for when I was really little. One, I was a pyromaniac, so I I lived in the principal's office for a lot of elementary school because I I set so many That's things fantastic. on fire. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and even when I was in. Why did you give it up? <laughs> um, I, I accidentally burned our kitchen down at home, and um, that was that was the last big fire. And I and I also when I was a patrol in sixth grade, I I set my patrol post on fire. There was a leaf fire that um, got out of a little out of control. Um, so I did a lot of reading in the principal's office when I was in school, and. Um, and I, I've always been like a crazy reader and, and I was always reading stuff that was totally inappropriate for my age. So I was, I was fascinated with, you know, Sylvia Plath when I was in, you know, second grade and stuff. So I, I was always, but I was always reading and I'm, I'm still, I, I consider myself a reader first, a writer second. What, were you from a family of readers to have that kind of access like Sylvia Plath you know like I was um my mom was a big reader my my dad was a mathematician my dad just died in April he was um a mathematician and a roboticist um so I came more from like the science stuff and then I was I was the weird kid you know writing in a family that you know, thought they could produce, you know, some scientists and engineers. <laughs> oh, if you don't mind me asking. Okay, so, like, my yeah. family is sort of similar in that, like, my parents and, like, my older sister and stuff, they're, and they've they really delved into, like, a more concrete subject, so sciences and mathematics and stuff like that. Uh, whereas writing, uh, I feel, is much more subjective. Have you ever found that a conflict with your interests in the sciences at any time? Yeah, um, it, because as soon as you're a writer, you're you're never on solid ground, and you're reaching for things that um, can kind of fall apart in your hands. You know, the 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 truth is so malleable, and it was hard being in a family where you know everybody's. Uh, comes from the other brain and and has yeah, you yeah. know the, this different style, but but that's going to make you a very interesting writer because you're gonna you're gonna be able to kind of have your foot in both worlds and you're yeah. gonna be able to write about those people in a much bigger way. Um, a lot of times, those math people don't have any awareness <laughs> about <laughs> how they are in the world. And um, so when you write about them, it gets very, very interesting because they don't they don't see themselves very often. So as a writer, I, I find that some writers may be protective of their work. And when it when it when it's released, it's no longer yours in a sense. Yeah. How do you feel about uh, film adaptations? If, if there ever were a film adaptation of any of your books, would you want to have an active role in those or would you really prefer a hands off approach? 
Well, that actually came up with um, with the Flickr of Old Dreams. I was approached by um, the person who produced a, a movie called um, Winter's Bone, um, which had um, Jennifer Lawrence. No, Jennifer, Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer yeah. Lawrence. Um, that didn't end up panning out, but she had asked me um, if I wanted to be um, a part of it, uh, writing it and stuff. And my feeling is that's a different art form. And some people are good at both art forms, but I didn't feel like I was. So I, I sort of feel like, um, like you said, it's not yours. Once, once you publish it, readers make of it what they want to. And, and if, um, if someone in the movie world looks at it and creates something entirely different, um, you know, like what would Jordan Peele do with this book? It would be something that I couldn't even imagine. And so I think the exciting thing is to kind of let it go. Um, but I do have a friend, she just got her book optioned by Plan B, which is Brad Pitt's movie company. And she's, and she's helping with the actual screenwriting. So you can do it, you can do it both ways. Eileen, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? I would like to know when your newest book is coming out and does it have a title yet? I think the title is going to be um, Song of Fools. And um, I'll show you, let me see if I can, I'll show you how far <laughs> <laughs> I have to go. Um, I've got a ways to go. I'm a very slow writer, so it'll it'll be ready when it's ready. And I tend to be someone who doesn't show people drafts. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's just gonna be ready when it's ready. Hopefully, it won't be published um, posthumously. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to reading it whenever you. you're done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for visiting with us and taking us into your world, your setting, uh, all of it. Uh, it, it. We really appreciate it. Um, and I, I think you've inspired some writers <laughs> right Robbie <laughs> definitely definitely <laughs>